Thank you, Professor Mellon, for the very kind introduction. I had the very good fortune of having Professor Mellon as my faculty advisor. His help and willingness to discuss my ideas and questions were invaluable during the process, so thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank Professors Bruner and DeMott for, for being here um, and for commenting on my notes. Um, it's a real honor to have you comment on my notes, so thank you. I originally stumbled on this idea when I read a case summary of the New York case, Kirshner v. KPMG, that was decided last year. In fact, this decision was handed down on October 21st, 2010. So for those of you who are still searching for a note topic, I was still searching at this point and another month. Um, so it's not ideal to get such a late start, but it also isn't fatal to the process. So back to the Kirshner decision. What I learned was that courts in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and now New York had all recently considered the same issue and had all come out differently. The issue is this. Should an auditor be permitted to raise the imperi delicto defense against a party suing on behalf of a corporation whose agents committed a fraud that the auditor negligently failed to detect? Here's an example. Imagine a public corporation which has officers who were involved in a fraud. The officers fraudulently, fraudulently represented that the corporation was profitable year after year when in fact it was losing money. Once this fraud is revealed, the corporation's stock price plummets and the shareholders want to recover some of their losses. One party the shareholders seek to recover from is the corporation's auditor. The shareholders, acting on behalf of the corporation, allege that because the auditor failed to meet professional standards in performing the audit, the auditor failed to reveal the fraud. And if the auditor had performed its duty, it would have detected the fraud early on and the corporation would not have suffered such losses. The auditors in this case raise the imperi delicto defense, which prevents a wrongdoer from bringing a claim before the court. The auditors argue that the corporation should not be permitted to bring suit because the fraud of the corporate officers is imputed to the corporation. This makes the corporation a wrongdoer, and the imperi delicto defense prevents a wrongdoer from bringing a grievance before the court. The problem that courts are grappling with is twofold. First, should the fraud of the corporate officers be imputed to the corporation? And if so, should the imperi delicto defense apply to insulate auditors from being sued by the corporation? The reason I believe New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York have all answered these questions differently is because these two doctrines, imputation and imperi delicto, do not work together in the way that courts have been analyzing them. Imputation is not fault-based. A corporation could have chosen all of its agents with care and try and tried to create incentives for them to behave according to the law. Still, if one agent commits a fraud and its dealings with a third party, the corporation will be bound by the agent's acts. Imperi delicto, on the other hand, requires a showing of fault. The doctrine is meant to prevent courts from settling a dispute between wrongdoers. If two parties were engaged in an illegality, one wrongdoer can't bring a grievance to the court to recover from the second wrongdoer. If he does, the second wrongdoer can raise the imperi delicto defense by showing that the plaintiff was responsible for the underlying illegality. What I explore in my note is whether courts can find a better measure for the corporation's wrongdoing. I believe there is a better measure. The corporation deserves a more holistic assessment than simply imputing the fraud of an agent to determine whether a corporation is a wrongdoer such that the imperi delicto defense would be successful against it. I propose that courts should judge a corporation based on the adequacy of the information gathering and reporting systems that are put in place by all corporations' boards of directors to deter and detect fraud. If the corporation has adequate systems in place, and if it is diligently implementing those systems, then I do not believe it can be considered a wrongdoer, and I think it should retain its ability to bring agreements before the court. With that overview, uh, we'll turn first to the details about the doctrines of imputation and imperi delicto, uh, second, about the applicable case law, and third, about why I think this solution is a good one. First, imputation. Imputation applies to agency relationships. Agency relationships exist when one party, the agent, such as a corporate officer, has the authority to bind another party, the principal, such as the corporation. Imputation instructs that a principal is deemed to know what her agent knows. Likewise, a corporation is deemed to know what its officers know. This is regardless of whether the information was actually communicated to the corporation. Imputation is important to protect parties who deal with the corporation. 
we must deal with corporations through people. And imputation allows us to transact with corporations knowing that the corporation will be legally responsible for the information that is exchanged between the agent and the third party. There's an important exception to imputation, the adverse interest exception. This exception deals with the case where the act of the agent is so contrary to its role in the agency relationship that the fiction of imputation, or the fiction that the agent communicated to his principal, is not maintained. This is because when the agent acts adversely to her principal, she will not share the information with her principal. And so the law should not hold the principal responsible for that information in this case. Courts use different standards to determine what constitutes adverse action. Much of the case law on corporate fraud cases focuses on this point. Did the agent's acts qualify as adverse under the applicable state law to defeat imputation? If imputation doesn't apply, then there's no basis for the unfair delictive offense. Courts generally consider whether the corporation retained a benefit from the, the agent's fraud, but how courts define benefit varies. In New York, for example, the court requires a showing that the agent totally abandoned his principal's inter interest. Under this rule, the adverse interest exception would not apply in the scenario I described previously, but is meant to apply only in very narrow circumstances, circumstances such as an officer embezzling from the corporation. In addition, in corporate fraud cases, courts have fashioned two exceptions to the adverse interest exception. First, the sole actor exception will prevent the adverse interest exception from applying when the agent is the sole actor in the corporation. The theory is that when the agent and the corporation are one and the same, the agent has no one to whom he can communicate, and so his knowledge should always impute to the corporation. The second exception is the innocent decision maker exception. This exception carves back the sole actor exception and instructs that the agent's adverse act should not be imputed if there are innocent decision makers who could have prevented the fraud had they learned of it. The rationale here is that it would be unfair to punish the innocent members of management when only one or a few were guilty of fraud. Courts have focused on imputation and these exceptions to it to determine whether imputation should be allowed, making the imperative delicto defense available. I believe that the focus on imputation and the adverse interest exception is misplaced. The imperative delicto defense should be given more thoughtful consideration. This defense provides that when a plaintiff is at equal fault for the underlying illegality, the defendant wins. This is because courts will not intercede to resolve a dispute between two wrongdoers. The main considerations for this are to deter illegality by denying judicial relief to wrongdoers and to avoid entangling courts in a dispute between wrongdoers. Generally, for the defense to apply, three conditions must exist. First, the plaintiff must bear substantially equal or greater responsibility for the illegality. Second, the illegal activity that the plaintiff engaged in must be the subject of the lawsuit. And third, even when these conditions are present, courts will use public policy considerations to defeat the defense. This is because the defense is an equitable defense and should not be applied when it will produce inequitable results. A central element in the defense is that the plaintiff must be a wrongdoer. But when the defense is used in conjunction with imputation, this element of the defense is not satisfied. Remember that imputation is not a fault-based doctrine. I believe there is a leap in logic from holding the corporation legally responsible for the acts of its agents through imputation to classifying it as a wrongdoer who may not bring a claim before the court. Indeed, courts have cautioned against the use of imputation and imperi delicto. Judge Learned Hand made this statement, which, although in this case it's applying to an individual, I find instructive here. Immoral conduct to be relevant must touch and take the plaintiff personally. The acts of his agent, though imputed to him legally, do not impute his conscience vicariously. Now let's turn to a brief look at how specifically courts have dealt with this issue. There are five main stops in this discussion. First, the Senko case is a pioneering case which set the stage for a strict application of the imperi delicto defense. Then we have New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York, as I've already mentioned. And lastly, the Delaware Court of Chancery has not addressed this issue under Delaware law, but it has managed to weigh in on the debate. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the Court of Chancery's ideas, but I wanted to at least mention that another important corporate jurisdiction has offered some ideas on this issue in dicta, and those ideas offer yet a different approach. So first, Senko. 
In Safeco, high-level managers with control over the corporation engaged in a massive fraud to prop up the financial statements of the company. This allowed them to engage in favorable business deals at low interest rates. The fraud was eventually uncovered and a litany of lawsuits ensued. One of the suits was Sinco's claim against its auditor, Seidman and Seidman, for failing to detect the fraud. In his opinion, Judge Posner famously declared, fraud on behalf of the corporation is not the same thing as fraud against them. <coughs> because the managers acted on behalf of the corporation in this case, that is, because the corporation received a benefit from the fraud, the innocent stockholders could not then bring a claim on behalf of the corporation to recover from the auditor. The Seventh Circuit's Cinco decision has proven to be very influential. It is this language that has led advocates to focus on imputation and the adverse interest exception. The thought being that corporate fraud cases turn on whether the fraud was on behalf of the corporation and imputation would apply, or it was not and the adverse interest exception would prevent imputation. But this was not the main point of the Cinco decision. Judge Posner's decision was driven by the goal of for furthering tort liability objectives. This was made clear in the Seventh Circuit's Schatt v. Brown decision one year later. The Schatt court confirmed that the Cinco decision was driven by the desire to compensate victims and to deter wrongdoing. In Cinco, top managers were involved in a massive fraud. Some of those involved in the fraud were those shareholders who were then seeking to recover from the auditor. Here, it was fair to foreclose the plaintiff's ability to sue its auditor. But in Schatt, directors were looting the corporation past the point of insolvency. And in this case, the Seventh Circuit did not find a benefit, or did not find that these actions could be classified as a benefit to the corporation, so it did not allow the defense. I believe that this distinction has been lost, and that Cinco has come merely to stand for the idea that a corporation should be imputed with its agent's fraud when that fraud benefited the corporation. And the corporation should then not be permitted <coughs> to sue its auditor for any role the auditor played in the fraud. Recently, though, courts have begun to take a closer look at the issue. The New Jersey Supreme Court held in 2006 that imperi delicto is not available to one who contributed to the fraud. Because the auditors in this case were alleged to have been negligent, the court found that that satisfied the contributed to element. In reaching this decision, the court used fairness arguments. It found that to bar all shareholders for the impropriety of some is unfair and improper. First, because shareholders in a large corporation are not in a position to monitor corporate action. And second, because this monitoring function is what auditors are for, and the law should seek to deter auditor wrongdoing. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court considered the issue in 2010. It considered the issue by focusing on agency law principles. It concluded that the appropriate distinction is between those who deal with the corporation in material good faith and those who do not. If the auditor is accused of being an active participant in the fraud, then it did not deal with the principal in good faith and would not be permitted to invoke imputation in the imperi delicto defense. For example, if the auditor is engaged in secret fraud with corporate officers, it knows that the agent's acts go unsanctioned by others in the corporation. And the rationale for imputation to protect third parties who are relying on their dealings with agents is not present in such a case. But the, this court found that if the auditor is merely accused of negligence, that is, it acted in good faith, then imputation would apply. That is, unless the agent's fraud did not benefit the corporation, in which case the adverse interest exception would block imputation. Most recently, the Court of Appeals in New York considered the issue in 2010. The Court of Appeals, in a 4-3 decision, took a firm stance that the corporation is imputed with its agent's fraud, and that the adverse interest exception only applies in the narrowest circumstances, and so the imperi delicto defense would bar the corporation's claim in the vast majority of cases. The Court of Appeals made the good point that the plaintiff in this case was requesting that the court make an exception to imputation only in the case of an auditor raising the imperi delicto defense. Because imputation with a narrow adverse interest exception is essential to protecting third parties in their dealing with corporations, the plaintiffs were not suggesting that the exception apply when a third party tried to recover from the corporation based on the agent's fraud. Rather, they were arguing that the adverse interest exception should apply only to prevent imputation in the face of an auditor raising the imperi delicto defense. The point here is that imputing the agent's fraud to the corporation in these situations is appropriate. 
The adverse interest exception shouldn't apply in most instances of corporate fraud. A third party must be able to hold the corporation responsible when the party is harmed by the fraudulent agents of a corporate of a corporation. Looking back at the three cases, notice a couple of things. First, the divergent ways that courts have approached this problem suggest that something is wrong with these approaches. Courts have gone down the path of the adverse interest exception. They have examined what constitutes a benefit such, such that the exception is not triggered, and they have applied exceptions to the exception in an attempt to come to the right results under the facts of the case before them. But it seems that the real issue, the corporation's wrongdoing, is being overlooked. I believe that there is a better way to address this issue and more squarely answer the underlying question. Should a corporation be permitted to recover from its auditor for negligently failing to detect corporate fraud? In my opinion, the answer is yes. If an auditor fails to meet the professional standards under its engagement with the corporation, the corporation should be permitted to hold it accountable for that. For example, in the New Jersey case, the auditors had failed to confirm that a $3 million check had been deposited. This was the company's single largest receivable. An auditor who performs negligently should be held accountable for that negligence. This is especially apparent when you consider that auditors are engaged because of the likelihood that corporate officers will commit fraud. And it is only in those cases where the very thing that auditors are retained to help guard against exists that auditors are then insulated from answering for their own potential wrongdoing. Under this suggested proposal, corporations would be permitted to hold their auditor accountable for negligent or fraudulent work. The only case in which corporations would not be permitted to do so is if the corporation can meaningfully be consider considered to be a wrongdoer, such that the policy justifications for imperi delicto are present. Prohibiting these suits does not deter illegality. The party seeking to recover did no wrong. Instead of deterring illegality, preventing these suits actually immunizes a group from even the possibility of liability for negligent work or active wrongdoing. And when you determine that the corporation is not a wrongdoer, the court is not being entangled in a dispute, in a dispute between two wrongdoers, again, because the plaintiffs before the court have done no wrong. If it is determined that the corporation has done wrong, then the rationale for imperi delicto exists, and only then does it make sense to bar the claim. Any attempt to measure corporate action is limited by the reality that a corporation is just a legal entity. It can only act through agents. But this doesn't mean that we can't identify a better measure of corporate action than imputation. The corporation's information gathering and reporting systems offer a more meaningful measure of the corporation's fault for its agent's fraud. These systems are created by the board of directors and implemented by high-level and low-level employees. If the corporation, through these systems, is honestly attempting to deter and detect fraud, it's not a wrongdoer. The presence of one fraudulent agent somewhere in the ranks of a corporation should not be enough to strip the corporation of its cause of action against an auditor who harmed it. If an auditor was negligent, or if it colluded with the fraudulent corporate agent, the corporation should have the opportunity to recover. Thinking back to the court's concerns faced, uh, the concerns courts faced in reaching, in trying to reach a just result by compensating victims and deterring wrongdoing, this proposal squarely addresses these concerns. In the case where there is a sole actor in the corporation, or when many of the corporation's agents are in on the fraud, it seems fair to prevent the corporate, the corporate entity from trying to recover from its auditor. But when the majority of managers are innocent and one among them has committed fraud, as in the case of the innocent decision maker exception, it does not seem fair to punish the many for the faults of the few. Cases have turned on whether or not it would be fair to consider the corporation a wrongdoer. But to reach the fair result, courts have created exceptions to a doctrine that does not touch the underlying issue. A better approach would squarely address this important issue. Judging a corporation by the adequacy of its information gathering and reporting systems offers a direct measure of the corporation's wrongdoing for the fraud at issue and squarely address, addresses whether the corporation should or should not be permitted to sue its auditor for wrongdoing. Evaluating the corporation's systems offers a measure which better captures the acts of the corporation as a whole, allows the corporation to retain its ability to sue an auditor for malpractice by implementing adequate systems, 
incentivizes corporations to pursue rigorous anti-fraud systems and relieves auditors of liability for malpractice only when the policy justifications for imperi delicto are present. The historical approach to the imperi delicto defense in corporate fraud, corporate fraud cases has proven to be inadequate, and I propose that courts would do better to try a new approach. to return to Washington and Lake as I have fond memories of being here a few years ago uh, and uh, uh, a delight to read the note. Uh, so I certainly I want to begin by applauding the note. I mean, I think it's an exemplary student note. It is written with extraordinary clarity. Uh, it's uh, ambitious, but reasonably so. Uh, it has a, a scope of the uh, it's also, I think, quite admirable. Uh, and it's very incisive. So I do have some substantive um, comments, not really reservations, but additional perspectives I'd like to share on this. Uh, but, I, but it's important that I begin by saying that I agree wholeheartedly with the, I would, what I would say is the essential analytic move that the note makes, which is to decouple agency doctrine from the other doctrines in the law to which agency serves as but a bridge. Uh, so this might seem, for those of you who, who are familiar with my own work or know roughly what it is, an unusual position for me to be taking because way too much of my career as a scholar was spent on the common law of agency. Uh, too much, perhaps. But I came to appreciate both the significance of the subject, and might we say it's necessary modesty. So agency does what it does, but that's it. And agency doesn't answer what I view as essentially a tort law question, which is the question under which uh, imperial delicto is appropriately provided. I think Christine's note is much clearer in making this point than some decisions from some obviously very distinguished courts, and that all by itself, I think, is an enormous accomplishment. Now, more, um, more in detail, uh, there's certainly a, a great deal in the note that I agree with and, and I admire. Uh, uh, I guess there are three, three general points I would like to make. I think it's helpful to think a little bit more about what it is specifically auditors do. Uh, in the context of a contemporary public company. Uh, because thinking about this a little bit when I was working on the, the written comment uh, gave me a little bit of reservation about how to operationalize Christine's proposal. So uh, auditors do what, external auditors? Well, it is, of course, management's responsibility to prepare the financial statements. Uh, it's also management's responsibility to give representations to the auditors uh, on the, the basis of which the auditors may at least to a some reasonable extent rely. Uh, it is not the job of the auditor, they're quite emphatic about this in the auditing profession, uh, to proceed on the assumption that fraud has been committed. So the, the auditor, following generally accepted auditing standards, confirms to the extent possible that the, that the financial statements were prepared consistently with generally accepted accounting principles. Okay? Um, to the extent that the auditor has not, as Christine notes, um, complied with generally accepted auditing standards, and clearly in the cases that you talk about that, that seems not to have been the case, then that is um, a breach of contract on the part of the auditor. It's also uh, tortious, and it's, it's inconsistent with the auditor's, uh, the auditor's, duty, the auditor's duty of care. Um, my concern is how to think about the corporation independently as a wrongdoer. And let me explain what I, what I mean by that. Uh, 
It is true that it's the corporation's management that prepares the financial statements. On the other hand, if the focus of the test is to be the adequacy of the company's own information gathering and reporting systems, realistically, I think, in the realm of financial accounting, it's financial controls and financial reporting system. We might ask, well, where do those systems come from? Is this something that the directors of a public company design for themselves? Well, no, they don't. Uh, typically, it is not unusual for the company's external auditor to play a significant role in designing the company's internal reporting and financial control systems and indeed to test the effectiveness of those systems. And as we, some of you I'm sure know, uh, you all should know if you've taken a corporation's course, directors have a right to rely when reasonable on opinions given by those whom they believe to be expert, which would in this case be the auditor opining as to the effectiveness and adequacy of internal control. So my concern, roughly, is I think it could well be very difficult for a court to disentangle responsibility for flawed internal controls. I think this is less so with regard to other categories of defendants who might wish to use this defense. But I think in the contemporary realm of public accounting and public companies, this would be difficult to do. Um, I would also point out that, as Christine says, it has long been the case that the auditor is engaged precisely in, anticip in the anticipation that there may have been slippage on the part of management. So a case that I'm uh, quite fond of is a New York opinion from uh, actually 1939, uh, National Surety Company against Libran, uh, in which the auditors failed to detect defalcations or theft by the cashier of the client company. The defendants argued that the, uh, the auditors argued that the client itself was contributorily negligent because, in fact, it had set up internal inadequate, clearly inadequate internal control systems. But the court replied, accountants, as we know, are commonly employed for the very purpose of detecting defalcations, which the employer's negligence has made possible. Additionally, accountants have long, or auditors have long, had the duty to report known discrepancies to the company's directors. Realistically, these days, the audit committee of the public company so I think in some extreme circumstances, the standard could be met. That is to say, the auditor, for example, could have detected a discrepancy, duly reported the discrepancy, and the director's uh, neglect right, or, or uh, more willfully uh, failed to uh, correct the inadequate system. But I'm concerned about operationalizing, um, I'm a bit concerned about operationalizing the test. The second observation I have is if you think about it, uh, particularly law students in the audience, it is very unusual as of 2011 to report that, frankly, four jurisdictions that are geographically proximate to each other have each surfaced such dramatically different rules of law on the same question. This is not typical in private law in the United States of America, right, in the 21st century, and indeed in large portions of the 20th century, for that matter. A consequence, I would argue, of this difference is that it places an unusual amount of weight on choice of law. So which jurisdiction's law should apply? Christine spared you a lot about the Delaware opinion. Unsurprisingly, for those of you who've taken the Delaware law-based course, right, in corporations, the Delaware chancellor has pretty ingenious arguments about, about why, well, maybe Delaware law should apply. I mean, maybe auditors are more like internal corporate fiduciaries, in which case, by virtue of the, Del of the internal affairs doctrine, Delaware law might apply. Okay, so that would be, in my opinion, problematic for a reason the opinion does not acknowledge, which is that the SEC would be very unhappy with auditors of a public company who are not independent, which would seem to me would follow if we reconceptualize them so dramatically as fiduciaries internal to 
uh, internal to the company. Uh, it would also mean that in some cases we would have the choice of law phenomena of depocage. That is to say, as to the same dispute, different bodies of law would apply to different issues, potentially. Right? So maybe Delaware law, if the uh, issue, if the claim against the auditor is aiding and abetting breach of fiduciary duty, uh, maybe uh, tort law, choice of law principles, if the claim is aiding and abetting fraud, uh, or and or simple negligence or gross negligence. Very complicated, potentially. Okay, maybe more complicated than this issue really should be bearing. This leads me to my final point. Perhaps there is a solution, and the solution, or at least a solution to consider, would be that this dimension of auditing with regard to public companies become part of the federal securities laws. Federal securities laws today say quite a bit about accounting and auditing. For example, they require that the books be audited by an independent auditor. Uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation, right now it seems like not so long ago, but it's really quite a while ago, uh, required um, in, in term of certification right, of the adequacy of internal controls by management. Uh, perhaps this issue, given the scope, the national scope on which public companies operate, the national scope on which the major audit firms operate, maybe it's time to think of, about taking this out of the box of uh, state level common law doctrine and shifting it over to what at least would be a uniform national standard to be set by uh, federal securities laws. I was thinking, this is my final point, I was thinking how the world must have looked in, say, 1932, before the Securities Act of 1933. Might there, indeed there were, significant differences on the circumstances under which a public company was subject to liability under the state law of fraud for misstatements in its prospectus? Well, certainly there were. Uh, this was too much of a disparity for, a, for what? For a nationwide capital market system that the Securities Act of 1933 envisaged. This is not to say that it achieved total perfection, but it did have the dramatic effect, if you think about it, of eliminating um, significant state level variation. Uh, and significant and, un, I would say, unnecessarily gnarly choice of law issues. So thanks again for the opportunity to think about the note uh, and uh, really great to be part of an occasion to celebrate it. Thank you. Well, Thanks so much for the opportunity to be here with you. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have this opportunity to comment on Christine's superb law review note. Before I do that, I want to just quickly thank those who were involved with organizing this event. I know a lot of work went into it, and uh, we all appreciate it. I also want to thank Professor DeMott for being here. It's a great pleasure to have uh, one of the leading scholars in the field here to join us for the notes colloquium. And uh, we very much appreciate the benefit of her insights on the vexing problems that are raised by these auditor malpractice cases. So we, we've heard a, quite a bit about the auditor malpractice case law. Rather than returning to that in detail, uh, let's turn to what I'll call the ontological dimensions of the problem. In characterizing the problem as ontological, I mean to suggest that a lot of the complexity of these cases springs from the fact that it always has been and in fact remains exceedingly difficult to say what a corporation is in the metaphysical sense. Back in 1614, in his report on the case of Sutton's Hospital, Sir Edward Cook memorably wrote, quote, the corporation aggregate of many is invisible, immortal, and rests only in intendment and consideration of the law. Now, by this, Cook essentially meant that corporations are complex legal fictions. Right? They are once an aggregate of real people, while at the same time, their own distinct legal people. 
with their own integrity. Sir William Blackstone nicely captured this complex relationship between fictional legal people on one hand and carbon-based breathing people on the other in his 1765 commentaries, where he, is, he explains that the corporation's various constituents, quote, are but one person in law, a person that never dies. In like manner as the River Thames is still the same river, though the parts which compose it are changing every instant. Right? Who knew corporate law could be so poetic, right? <laughs> parts which compose it are changing every instant. Now, Blackstone's analogy nicely expresses, I think, the duality of corporate personhood. Once consists of uh, an aggregation of real people while at the same time constituting its own distinct entity with its own legal identity and integrity. Now, corporations have obviously evolved considerably over the centuries, uh, but the ontology of the corporation remains every bit as elusive today. If anything, it's only becoming more difficult to say what corporations are as firm structures and holding company structures uh, grow larger and more complex, uh, and as the ubiquity of the modern business corporation brings it into an ever-expanding uh, range of law and policy domains. For example, just within recent years, we found ourselves grappling with corporate political speech, which requires us not only to thrash out what the constitutional status of business entities is, but at the same time to think through all the various governance implications, say, whether the shareholders who are bankrolling corporate political speech ought to have some capacity to constrain what managers and officers can do in this regard. Another example, of course, is corporate criminal liability. Given criminal law's focus on moral blameworthiness, it's not obvious how we go about punishing fictional entities. As Baron Thurlow, the late 18th century Lord Chancellor, has famously said to have remarked, Corporations have, quote, no soul to be damned and no body to be kicked. To apply the criminal law to a fictional entity obviously requires some mental gymnastics, right? We could, we could go after the carbon-based breathing people who inhabit the firm, but, but who? How many of them? And how, how widely do we cast the net? And how do we define what the net would be? Maybe we find the entity itself, but of course, how do we decide whether the entity as such is culpable in a way that makes us comfortable, in essence, visiting the punishment on all the other various constituencies of the corporation who may well have had nothing at all to do with the problem. Now, what corporate political speech and corporate criminal liability have in common at the most elemental level is that they similarly reveal the conceptual instability of the corporate form itself. How do we decide who's inside the firm, as it were, and who's outside? whose acts count as corporate acts in these cases where associating the entity as such with one constituency versus another can be enormously consequential in the lives of everybody whose fortunes are bound up with those of the business firm. Now, the problem that we're here to discuss, the intersection of corporate fraud and auditor malpractice, I think is another reflection of this core ontological problem. What is the corporation's posture vis-a-vis -vis fraud committed by one set of people working for it, yet undetected by others? Specifically, corporate officers cooking the books and external auditors negligently failing to detect what a diligent audit would have revealed. In this unhappy circumstance, do we treat the corporation and through it various other constituencies as a wrongdoer by association with the officers or as a victim of auditor negligence? The problem is particularly acute if we style the external auditor itself as a quasi-insider, an agent, like the officers, as Delaware Chancellor Leo Strine does. To take the analogy a bit further, it's as if we've got cross currents in Blackstone's River Thames. The assumed unity of purpose no longer holds, and courts grappling with these cases are left to flounder in the conceptual turbulence for lack of stable moorings. Now, I think it's not an overstatement to say that the intersection of corporate fraud and auditor malpractice requires grappling with some of, the some of the very most vexing questions in this field. And this, Christine very deftly accomplishes in her note, more deftly, I think, than most courts have. I'm not going to rehash what you've already heard. I'll just remark that she presents a thorough and persuasive critique of what, I, what can fairly be characterized a muddled case law. She argues, I think, compellingly that courts have erred both in law and policy by permitting auditors to defend malpractice suits by too readily pinning the wrongdoing on the corporation itself. As you now know, the imperi delicto defense denies a remedy to a plaintiff deemed equally at fault, and outcome courts have reached by imputing the officer fraudster's knowledge to the corporation under agency law. 
Of the many strengths of Christine's analysis, perhaps the most important is the one that she emphasizes most in the note and emphasized here. The fact that the underlying aims of the imperi delicto defense and imputation under agency law are fundamentally distinct and that this matters. The imperi delicto defense applies where the plaintiff is a wrongdoer, but imputation isn't fault-based. The agency analysis simply doesn't illuminate whether the principal is a wrongdoer in some relevant sense. Now, while Christine doesn't dispute the policy aims that justify the imperi delicto defense, I think she fairly suggests that we've inappropriately expanded this defense through agency analysis that doesn't speak to the core issue, whether the corporate entity itself can reasonably be branded a wrongdoer. Now, academics like to say that it takes a theory to beat a theory, which is just a shorthand way of saying that it's easier to tear structures down than to build a new one that's better. To her credit, uh, Christine reinforces her critique of the case law by proposing a new way to approach these cases, rightly perceiving that the problem in its essence amounts to determining what wrongdoing ought to be treated as corporate wrongdoing, she proposes a reasonable solution that I think is both doctrinally consistent with the approach taken in other similarly thorny disputes, and yet remains mindful of the policy concern that we don't want to excessively expand auditor liability. Given that the board's fiduciary duties under corporate law already require efforts to prevent and detect fraud and other illegal conduct, she proposes that we use that pre-existing framework to evaluate corporate wrongdoing in auditor malpractice cases. Now, this response to the underlying ontological problem, I think, is elegantly pragmatic. Whatever the corporation may be vis-a-vis -vis its agents, we can coherently judge whether the entity itself should be treated as a wrongdoer by reference to the quality of its institutionalized efforts to prevent and detect wrongdoing. This approach would naturally sharpen incentives to monitor for wrongdoing, because doing so would help preserve the corporation's ability to pursue negligent auditors. And while we don't want to scare off the auditors through excessive liability, there are, of course, other levers that we can pull to more finely calibrate the level of exposure, CAS, uh, proportionate liability regimes, and so on. I think Christine's proposed solution is an appealing one, and I think there's reason to believe that it could bring clarity and predictability to an otherwise incoherent case law. Now, it's certainly my hope that courts are going to take up the conversation that Christine has initiated, and in the spirit of generating momentum in that direction, I will conclude with a few remarks on how courts might operationalize the general framework that she sets out for us. As a threshold matter, Christine wisely acknowledges that we couldn't just import the fiduciary duty-based approach as is, because that would set the bar way too low. Corporate law, in fact, demands very, very little uh, in the way of board monitoring efforts, uh, reflecting deep concern that excessive liability might render outside directorships unappealing. This is effectively the fear that motivates the business judgment rule. Were such a low bar applied in auditor malpractice cases, however, we might just create an equal and opposite problem. Officers' fraud would be attributed to the corporation only very rarely, which would undercut the imperi delicto defense. The pendulum swings too far in the direction, and all of a sudden now we're worried about excessive <coughs> auditor liability. Now, one way to strike an appropriate balance might be to look beyond corporate law's fiduciary duty-based approach to what inspired it. The uh, Caremark decision that establishes Delaware's framework for evaluating the board's monitoring efforts was itself inspired by a means of assessing corporate wrongdoing in, a no in another 40 subject area that I mentioned a few minutes ago, corporate criminal liability. Then-Chancellor Bill Allen, writing in 1996, observed that the federal organizational sentencing guidelines were having such an enormous impact on how these corporate programs were designed and implemented that a faithful corporate fiduciary couldn't possibly ignore them. Now, basically, the guidelines set out a system of penalties for business entities convicted of crimes, but then offer penalty reductions where a company has, quote, an effective compliance and ethics program. Now, the logic should sound familiar by this point. We can coherently judge the corporation's culpability by reference to the quality of its institutionalized efforts to prevent and detect criminal conduct. And the framework for evaluating the effectiveness of such programs could provide a good starting point for developing a similar framework that could be of use in the auditor malpractice context. Now, the guidelines naturally require assessment of program design, which, as Professor DeMott observed, could be complicated if the auditors participated in designing the company's internal controls. 
At the same time, the guidelines also require quite extensive assessment of the program's implementation, which ranges all the way from board level efforts down to those of rank and file employees. This includes training initiatives, <coughs> monitoring and evaluation of the program, including a reporting system that would be available to employees and others, uh, incentives and disciplinary procedures to promote enforcement, and of course, appropriate responses to misconduct once it's detected. This sort of broad evaluative approach could uh, provide a useful model in developing a multi-factor test for auditor malpractice cases that would help reduce the indeterminacy of an unavoidably fact-intensive inquiry. Now, this is one approach. There are undoubtedly others. The point here is really just to reinforce what I think Christine's note uh, persuasively argues, which is that a, a practically and conceptually superior approach to these cases is within our reach. Uh, as I noted, I very much hope that courts are going to take up the conversation that she has initiated. Uh, in the meantime, I'm sure you all join me in congratulating Christine for a truly top-notch uh, top piece of scholarship. I'm confident it will garner the attention uh, that it deserves. <laughs>